Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Let's do a deep dive and jump into this here. What's first? A magical mixture of rules, options for the world's greatest RPG using this book. This is written for players and dungeon masters alike. This book offers options to enhance characters and campaigns in any D&D world. All right. There's a lot here. Actually, let me go back. This is a very important part. It's all optional. All things in D&D are, right, folks? It is upon the responsibility. It's the responsibility of the dungeon master and the players at the table to coordinate and figure out what are the things that allow their game to function best. What rules do you need to omit? What things do you need to gloss over? What do you need to house rule, homebrew, so on and so forth to achieve the ultimate thing in a D&D game, which is to ensure that your table is having the most fun. If something official or otherwise doesn't fit for your group, for your table, for the story you're trying to tell, get rid of it. It doesn't matter if it was created by Watsi's world-class designer or otherwise. So this is just another one of those instances. As it says here, everything in this book is optional. Each group, guided by the DM, decides which of these options, if any, to incorporate into a campaign. You can use some, all, or none of them. We encourage you to choose the ones that fit best with your campaign story and with your group's style of play. Whatever options you choose to use, this book relies on the PHB, the Core 3, the Monster Manual, DMG, and it can be paired with options that are found in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. So that's what's here. As you scroll down, you have 10 rules to remember. We don't need to go over all of those. Number one rule is the most important. The DM basically determines how to handle the rules, so on and so forth. There, you do not have to, in D&D, have strict adherence to what the books say. If it doesn't fit, get rid of it, all right? So you may find that there's a lot of stuff here that's just too wonky for your table, that goes against the grain, that changes things up too much. This book has gained a, a wealth of attention for good, bad, or otherwise. A lot of people are talking about it because it's a step of uh, where Watsi is really changing things up a lot. Now, the intention of this video is to simply spotlight and highlight everything that is here. It is not for me to talk opinions about how I feel about these things and how I might use these in my campaign, so on and so forth, all right? I just want to highlight everything that's here, and maybe by the end of that, you can better determine whether or not you wish to spend your hard-earned money on this sort of content, okay? So we'll talk through what's here. It's going to be an extremely long video. There's just a lot of options, a lot to cover, upwards of an hour and a half, maybe two hours, but there will be time stamps, time stamps in the description so you can skip ahead to whatever it is that you are specifically looking for. All right. First up, character options, customizing your origin. This is basically to say that sometimes the races don't fit the style of character that you're wanting to play, right? So what I mean is you want to play a dwarf. You are excited by them aesthetically. You want to play something that is a little shorter, a little more gruff, blunt, and to the point with their words and their personality. But if you look at the rules, and let me kind of jump over real quick. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the races section. You'll notice that as a dwarf, you start as the default with plus two con, right? And then depending on what sub race you pick, so hill or mountain, you'll get another boost to another stat. Typically, your stats will usually be plus two somewhere and plus one somewhere else. For example, the Dragonborn, plus two strength, plus one charisma, right? The Half-Elf, plus two charisma, plus one to a couple of other ability scores. Half-Orc, plus two strength, plus one con. That's what's written. What this new customizing origin section is doing is it's allowing you to choose your own ability score increases, to choose your own languages, to choose your own proficiencies, to better fit the style of character that you're wanting to play. You want to be a dwarf aesthetically, Something about them appeals to you, but you want to be more of a bookish dwarf. Typical dwarves will have plus two to their constitution, right? That's what's written in the player's handbook. But you want to be a dwarf that's on the search for arcane knowledge. You're a wizard. So now you can play the dwarven wizard while you can always do that anyway, right? But what happens is oftentimes we're at odds with what exactly we want to play quite simply because what we write on paper, our stats, our numbers don't line up with the background and the story of our character. So you need to make that decision of, do you play the typical dwarf who's rough and tumble, gruff, 
was in the mines, broad-shouldered, really tough skin. Therefore, when I write plus two con on my character sheet, it makes sense. Or do you go against the grain and play the wizardy dwarf, but yet your stats still don't follow suit? Now what this is saying is right here, here's how to do it. Take any ability score increase you gain in your race and subrace and apply it to an ability score of your choice. For example, if the ability score increase trait of your race or subrace increases your con by two and your wisdom by one, you could instead increase your intelligence by two and your charisma by one. So going back to the races here, as a dragonborn, I can just be a stealthy, sneaky, Jack Sparrow type of dragonborn. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to go plus two dex, plus one charisma. Assign those stats as you see fit. You can do the same thing with languages now. You could have always done this, but instead of necessarily having to house rule it, what this book offers is an official place where you can point your players to and simply say, hey guys, we can use the customizing your origin feature that's offered in Tasha's. And that informs your players how they can go about making their characters if they want to do something, you know, they want to be a half-orc that's really roguish. Or they want to be a, a, a dwarf that's a wizard. Or they want to be an elf that is super, super durable and strong. Plus strength, plus con. Okay? And this just provides us with a, a method of going about doing that. That's what this whole little section is about. To customize languages, you know, replace each language in your languages trait with a language from the following list. Obviously, dungeon masters are free to decide what languages are appropriate based on their story, their world, and whatnot. Now, for proficiencies, this is a big one. It has just this sort of swapping chart. So when you are given a certain skill from your race or a certain martial weapon, you can just look across the chart and replace it with something else. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at this. Your elf, the story of your elf, might be a musician who chooses proficiency with a musical instrument, which is a tool, instead of with longswords. Elves typically get longswords proficiency just by being an elf, right? That's sort of the, the weapon of their race. And now I want to change that out so it's a martial weapon, and I just want to simply choose a different martial weapon. Or I want to choose a tool, which would be the musical instrument. Skill for skill. Similarly, elves start with proficiency in the perception skill. Your elf might not have the keen senses associated with your kin, and therefore you could take proficiency in a different skill, such as performance. So you can see, you can kind of create your character the way you want and just mix and match these proficiencies, these languages, these ability scores. You can take it all a step further with this custom lineage thing here. Instead of choosing one of the game's races for your character at first level, you can use the following traits to represent your character's lineage, giving you full control over how your character's origin shape them. You're a humanoid. You determine your appearance and whether or not they resemble any of your kin. Dragonborn doesn't quite fit, neither does lizard folk, but you know you want to look somewhat reptilian, maybe even frog-like. Okay? You're a humanoid. You kind of have this scaly skin, but you're neither dragonborn nor lizard folk. We're creating our own lineage, where we came from. Size, you choose, small or medium. Your base walking speed is 30 feet. You get to put one ability score increase by two. You get a feat of your choice. Variable trait, choose one of the following options. Dark vision with range of 60 feet or proficiency in a skill of your choice. And then, kind of looking through these list of languages, choose a language that fits for you. Perhaps you weren't even raised among lizard folk or dragonborn or any of your kind, and you were enslaved as an infant, as most of your tribe, way down deep in the underdark. I think something like deep speech is the language of mind flayers. Maybe that's why you speak common and deep speech instead of any other language, right? So there it is. You can kind of create your own lineage. Now, the last part of this section talks about changing things, things that perhaps were otherwise permanent. You can change your skills through gameplay. So I've already made my character. I've, I'm proficient in certain skills. And later on, I determined that I'm not using investigation that much. I'm using deception a lot. I'm now the face of the party. The party always wants me to go forward and lie and use my words to maneuver our way through certain situations. Hey, DM, can I take off the bubble that's in investigation and bubble in deception instead? This is kind of informing the DM and the players how to go about changing such things. To take that even a step further, you can now change your subclass. 
And the way it says it is, with your DM's approval, you can change your subclass when you would normally gain a new subclass feature. Okay, I don't know exactly when you gain, gain what subclass features, but let's say, for example, you're currently playing a rogue and you're an arcane trickster. And you reach level 7, and you would normally acquire some new feature for the Arcane Trickster subclass. At that moment, instead of gaining that feature, you just tell your DM, I'm not feeling the Arcane Trickster. Can I swap out and become an assassin instead? I just feel like it's going to fit better with the storyline. These are changes that normally would require you to make a new character. Right? Maybe to be a bit reckless in your play where the DM can tell secretly or sort of behind the scenes that you're trying to get your character killed off so you can make a new one. Yes, of course you can simply just come to the table and say, I'm not feeling this character. Next session, can I come in with a new dude? But maybe that character, the name of that character, the story, the background is already ingrained into the, the story arc. Maybe they've already met a bunch of NPCs. You don't really want to make a brand new character. Because they've weaved into the storyline already. They've made friends and allies and enemies. The companions, the other players at the table, are familiar with that character. But yet you want to make a subclass change. This is talking you through how you might do that with a few little blurbs and tips and tricks from the DM storyline-wise of ways that might explain how your arcane trickster has now become an assassin or a thief. Okay, So that's what this is. is it's just offering... A wealth of options, a wealth of freedom. As I mentioned in the very beginning, you can use the custom lineage thing, but not allow changing of subclasses. You can allow changing of skills and subclasses, but not allow any of this ability score increase stuff. Mix and match, throw it onto your table as you see fit. So I do like that element of it. It's all just options. And I've heard some sort of points of contention about it where people say, well, then why do we even need to have a book for this? Why can't we just house rule everything and allow my players to put their stats at character creation wherever they want? I think by having it in sort of an official thing, especially for new players, people that are sort of strict with adhering to the rules and saying, well, this is what's written, this is what we have to use. It at least gives the DMs and players a place where we can point directly to this and say, go to Tasha's, we're using these sections. Real easy to kind of adjudicate that stuff, if that's the word. All right, that's the sort of character option section. Let's take a look at all of the individual changes. You can see there's a bunch of every class, basically, right? And there's new features and new options, new subclasses. So the Artificer is now official, world-free. The Artificer was already a thing in Eberron, but going back to especially newer players and newer Dungeon Masters that feel like D&D is made to be played by the rules. I will inform you from someone doing this for 40 years. D&D, first and foremost, is whatever you make of it. Use whatever it is you need to use. Allow what you want to allow. If someone comes up with a cool story, but it's not a race or a class that's available in the world you're playing in, you make that decision for yourself. People used to say, I want to play an artificer, but are they only Eberron classes? Is, is it only the world of Eberron that has artificers? Is there something attached to the lore of that world that I can't play an artificer in Greyhawk or my DM's homebrew world? Now putting the artificer in sort of a, a world-free, not world-specific book, it kind of gives us the artificer in official format. And it's all here. I'm not going to go over it too much. It's already in Eberron. But if you don't have the Eberron book, it's all here. The full charts, how you handle artificers, what are their proficiencies, so on and so forth. Okay. As far as subclasses for the Artificer, the three that are in Eberron are here as well in full treatment, the Alchemist, the Artillerist, and the Battlesmith. These are subclasses that have already been, they're out, they're out there already in other official books, but now they are here as well, okay? And I don't think anything has changed. The Artillerist, the, Ar the Battlesmith, and the Alchemist are exactly as written in Eberron. However, there is a new guy, a new subclass called the Armorer. I'm not going to go over it. The video will be prohibitively long if I covered every single subclass to full detail, but you're welcome to kind of, as I scroll through, pause the video as you see fit, whatever is best for you. The armorer basically plays into a lot of their armor, as it would make sense, right? The minute you pick the subclass, you gain proficiency with heavy armor. You also gain proficiency with smith's tools. You then sort of enhance that armor further giving you various attributes and benefits when you're wearing that armor later on you can choose two modes kind of very iron man-ish 
You can choose to go into what's called guardian mode, which gives you certain traits and abilities, or you can choose to go into infiltrator mode. And I believe right here, you can change the armor's model whenever you finish a short or long rest. So after you wake up from that rest, you can choose, do I want to go into guardian mode today or do I want to go into infiltrator mode today? Going into infiltrator mode, for example, gives you a lightning launcher, which can either be on your fists or on your chest. You choose. And it's basically a ranged weapon where you can shoot out to a range of 300 feet lightning damage. You also increase your walking speed by 5 feet while you're in infiltrator mode. And remember, it stays in that mode until you choose to change it during a short after a short or long rest. You have a dampening field as sort of this magical element that's weaved into and through the armor that you're wearing, which gives you advantage on dexterity checks. So you can see how you can kind of change how your character plays and, and what their options are based on your armor. You get to attack twice at fifth level. You can infuse separate pieces of your armor, your boots, your helmet, separately, chest piece. You get additional enhanced benefits at much higher level, depending on whether you're in guardian or infiltrator mode, and so on. Okay? So there's the artificer with three sub four subclasses. The three that have already been there in Eberron, the Alchemist, Artillerist, and the Battlesmith, and the new one now called the Armorer. Alright? As we look into the Barbarian. One thing that's been done here in this book is it offers optional class features for all of the classes. Now, these are not specific to a certain subclass. These optional class features are sort of new things that all barbarians get. New things that all rogues, all wizards get. All right, what are the new ones? One is called Primal Knowledge. This is at third level. So every barbarian, once you reach third level, and again at tenth, you gain proficiency in a skill of your choice. And then a new 7th level feature for all level 7 barbarians is something called Instinctive Pounce, which basically says as part of the bonus action when you rage, you also get to move up to half your speed. All right? There are two new primal paths here. You have a Path of the Beast, and then you have Path of Wild Magic. Path of the Beast, the essence of it is when you rage, you basically take on these bestial forms, giving yourself natural weapons such as Bite, Claw, and Tail. Claw basically lets you make sort of another claw attack as part of the attack action. Bite deals piercing damage as you literally bite them and if you happen to be at 50 percent or less hit points i think something called the bloodied state back in fourth edition you get to heal when you bite someone equal to your proficiency bonus all right so it's not a lot but you get a little heal from it and then the last sort of uh appendage or natural weapon you have is your tail attack right these are things that manifest when you rage as a barbarian following the path of the beast your tail attack gives you reach and you can use the tail attack defensively to uh, increase your AC against an attack that's coming in. You have some options you can choose after you finish a short or long rest. You can basically become much better at swimming, much better at climbing, much better at jumping. Bestial, you know, the, the beast soul, things that make you function like an animal. At 10th level, you get one of these two choices. What happens is you have sort of this curse. Whenever you attack with one of your natural weapons... Your enemy, your target, if you hit them, needs to make a wisdom saving throw. If they fail, you kind of curse them, giving them one of these two negative consequences. And then the last one is called Call of the Hunt at level 14. You basically enter the hunt, and then you can ask allies that are around you within a certain distance to join that hunt. If they do, they'll be able to add a d6 to their damage rolls when they attack, but you'll also get five temporary hit points for each creature that's sort of joined in the hunt. You can, of course, pause the video to get exact details on what it does, but that's the essence of this primal path. <clears throat> the path of wild magic, the essence of this is the wild magic chart, which is different than the sorcerer wild magic chart and the sorcerer origin that's in the player's handbook. This is a lot more simplified and I think just more elegant to, to work your way through. When you choose the Path of Wild Magic, you can detect magic within 60 feet, and if it has a spell associated to it, you learn what school of magic is associated with it. Yes, you're limited in that you can only use this a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, but it's just kind of a cool feature that you have access to. And then the moment you rage, you roll on this wild magic chart and you have sort of this, whatever the effect is, the result, you have that in play that you can use at various times. Like for example, if you roll a two, as a bonus action on each of your turns, you can teleport up to 30 feet, okay? And then a lot of your path features as you level up, play into that wild magic, 
right? At sixth level, you have the option of one of these two things that you can use. At tenth level, any time that you take damage while you're raging or any time that you fail a saving throw, you can re-roll on this wild magic chart to maybe give you something better. And then your 14th level feature basically says, instead of rolling a single D8, let's roll two D8, choosing the best. So you have more um, opportunity to kind of find the magical effect that you want. That's the path of wild magic, all right? You really need to look at the chart and figure out if that's something for you. But that's the essence of it. Again, pause the video as you wish to get into that. What's next? We have the bard. So optional class features, you have kind of a new enhanced spell list. All of these spells, except for the one, the two with the asterisk, are from the player's handbook. We'll go over those spells when we get to the new magic spells section. A new bardic feature is, this is for all level two bards. Remember, it's not specific to any specific subclass, all right? If a creature has a bardic inspiration die from you and casts a spell that restores hit points or deals damage, the creature can roll that die and choose a target affected by the spell. Add the number rolled as bonus to the hit points regained or the damage dealt, and then the Bardic Inspiration die is then lost. So Magic Inspiration is a new feature available to all Bards. Another one, you'll see this come through a lot with a lot of the classes, is kind of this versatility thing. This kind of leans into what I talked about in the beginning about options and sort of making new choices. If you don't like the skill or you don't like the subclass you've chosen, here's some ways that you might be able to swap that out. It's a very swapping sort of a thing. Here... The moment you gain an ASI, so level 4, level 8, and whatnot, you can replace one of the skills or basically get rid of a skill that you're proficient in and give yourself expertise in another skill, or, and you have to choose one of these two, you can replace a cantrip with a different cantrip, all right? So that's a new, available to all bards at level 4. Two new bard colleges. One is the College of Creation. That's the new one, I believe. Call it College of Eloquence. I won't go over. That was available and first came out in Mythic Odysseys of Theros, so a previously released book. But the College of Creation, you're doing kind of what it says. You're singing the songs of creation and kind of creating something from nothing, kind of uh, animating objects, things like this. So you have something called the Moat of Potential. I'll let you read through that yourself. Whenever you give someone an inspiration die, this little invisible, not invisible, but an intangible, invulnerable moat. And it can look like a musical note, a star, or a flower floats nearby them. And whenever that person that has your Bardic Inspiration die uses their Bardic Inspiration for an ability check, an attack roll, or a saving throw, the moat gives them sort of enhanced effects and things they can do. You can, at third level, the moment you pick the subclass, you have the performance of creation, creating as an action one non-magical item of your choice. It has some stipulations on how expensive the item can be, what size it is, so on and so forth. But as you increase in level, you can kind of create bigger, better objects, okay? Animating performance is a cool one at six level. You can animate a non-magical item, which is different than the animate object spell. As a bonus action, you can command it to use its action. It does these various things. It acts on your initiative count, but it can move and use reactions on its own. It can take the dodge action unless you've chosen to use your bonus action to do something else with it. So you use this non-magical item, you animate it, and it becomes a thing that stands around for, it lives for one hour or until it reduces zero or of course, until you die. And then creative crescendo which is where it leans into the performance of creation where you're creating these non-magical items, but it now allows you to create multiple of them and you're no longer limited by the gold piece value. So you just get, get to create more and better things. I'm not going to go over the College of Eloquence. You can look to Mythic Odysseys of Theros, but it's basically using really elegant words to manipulate, you know, to give you benefits and give negative effects to your enemies, all right? I'll let you kind of scroll through and pause that as you will. All right. Let's look at the clerics. Optional class features. You have a new spell list, again, with some new spells that we'll go over in a little bit. Harness Divine Power. This is available to all level 2 clerics. You expend a use of your channel divinity to fuel your spells. As a bonus action, you touch your holy symbol, utter a prayer, and regain one expended spell slot, the level of which can be no higher than half your proficiency bonus rounded up. All right? Cantrip versatility. Once again, leaning into that, swapping things out. Whenever you would get an ASI, you can also replace a cantrip if you wish. Blessed Strikes is a new thing available 
to all clerics, this replaces Divine Strike or the potent spellcasting feature. When a creature takes damage from one of your cantrips or weapon attacks, you deal an additional 1d8 radiant damage. Okay? Now, Divine Domains. We won't go over this one as well. Order Domain, this came from Ravnica, I think. They're tied into a lot with the Azorius Senate, I think. So Order Domain is really, really cool. You really want to look through this stuff. I'll scroll through slowly. You can pause it as you will to see kind of what's what. There's some really, really cool abilities in here in the Order Domain. All right, now we have the Peace Domain. I do not think, and I will check very quickly, Peace Domain was in Theros. No, doesn't look like it. I think this is new to Tasha's. Um, new Domain spells, of course. You gain proficiency in Insight, Performance, or Persuasion, uh, one, one of them. As an action, you choose a number of creatures within 30 feet of you equal to your proficiency bonus, and you create a magical bond with them. And there's some higher level abilities and, and features that play into that. So here you go. I'll leave it. That's essentially it right there on screen. So you can read through that. So you have this new peace domain. And then another new domain, which I really like a lot, is the twilight domain. Here's your new spell list. Again, all of these spells are from the player's handbook. You gain proficiency with martial weapons and heavy armor. This is your first level feature. Check this one out. Eyes of Night, first level twilight domain feature. You can see through the deepest gloom. You have dark vision out to a range of 300 feet. As an action, you can magically share the dark vision of this feature with willing creatures within 10 feet of you for up to an hour. Really neat. Vigilant Blessing. As an action, you can give one creature you touch advantage on the next initiative roll. You have this thing called Twilight Sanctuary. Sanctuary, it creates the sphere, and then it creates light within it. The sphere moves with you, and whenever a creature ends its turn in the sphere, you can either end a charm or frightened effect, or you grant it temporary hit points equal to 1d6 plus your cleric level. And then later on, I think it's Twilight Shroud right here, you and your allies have half cover while they're in that Twilight Sanctuary sphere. And then you have Steps of Night and Divine Strike, two more features for this new... I like this one a lot, the Twilight Domain for Clerics. So you have those three new domains, or three domains at least listed here, Order, Peace, and Twilight. Order came from, I believe, Ravnica. All right, let's see what's what. We have New Druid. All right, optional class features. Here's the new spell list with the new spells, Summon Beast, Summon Face, Summon Elemental. When we go over those, you can see if there's any difference from Conjure, Elemental, and, and such. That's already in Player's Handbook. Here's a new second level druid feature available to all. You gain the ability to summon a spirit. As an action, you can expend a use of your wild shape feature to cast the fine familiar spell without material components. And this familiar is a fey instead of a beast. Disappears after a number of hours equal to half your druid level. Cantrip versatility. When you would get an ASI, you can replace a cantrip. Swap that out. Here's the new kind of new, Druid Circles. I won't go over the Circle of Spores. This is in Ravnica. It's a very, very cool... My wife played the Circle of Spores in one of my campaigns. Um, and it's, it's it has its own thing. It's very different than most of your other Druids. Um, look through this for sure. So that's the Circle of Spores. That is now here. So similar to the Artificer being here, where it removes the question of, hey, can I play an Artificer even if we're not in Eberron? If you're not playing in Ravnica you still have access now in an official book if you decide to use as a DM, if you use Tasha's, you now have the order domain. You now have the Circle of Spores in here. So Circle of Spores is one new druid. I kind of like the Circle of Stars. This is brand new to Tasha's here. The Circle of Stars allows druids to draw on the power of starlight. So at level two, after you pick this um, circle, you create a star chart as part of your heavenly studies. It's a tiny object and can serve as a spellcasting focus for your druid spells. It's a map, essentially, and you determine its form by rolling on the star map table, which is down here, like what it looks like, or you can kind of come up with your own details. While holding this map, you get all of these benefits. You don't pick one, you get all these bullet points. So you have the Guidance Cantrip, Guiding Bolt, you can cast Guiding Bolt without expending a spell slot, and so on. And then there's some things that play into this map. Starry form, this one's neat. As a bonus action, expend a use of your wild shape to take on a starry form, rather than transforming into a beast. While you're in starry form, re you retain your game stats, your body takes on a luminous, 
Look, your joints glimmer like stars, and glowing lines connect them on a star chart. You also shed bright light, up to 10 feet, so on and so forth. And then when you assume, assume your starry form, you basically form these constellations, and this artwork's really cool. The art in this book, I'm not going to, similar to how I said, I'm not going to get into opinions on whether I'd use all this stuff and what's my overall thoughts on it. I will say the art in this book is very hit or miss. Not up to par for wizard, you know, professional design level official book standards, but this particular piece is really cool. You kind of, in your starry form, you choose this constellation that's sort of settled into your body. And depending on what you choose, the archer, the chalice, or the dragon, it gives you certain benefits. Cosmic Omen, after you finish a long rest, you can consult your star map for omens. When you do, you roll a die. And depending on if you get odd or even, wheel or woe, certain things happen. Okay, you can pause that. And then Twinkling Constellations, the your starry form basically improves. The things that you get by you choosing either Archer, Chalice, or Dragon become bigger and better. And finally, Full of Stars. <laughs> what a clever name. While in your starry form, you become partially incorporeal, giving you resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Notice it did not say BPS from non-magical, just bludgeoning, piercing, slashing, period. So you now create this starry form with these constellations. Visually, it sounds really neat as it's now replacing your wild shape feature or you're not turning into a beast. So kind of has its own little thing. That's the circle of stars. And then circle of wildfire. I saw this around for a long time in un Unearth Arcana. So now it's here in official form. You summon, here's your list of wildfire spells. You summon this wildfire spirit, which has its own stat block and the way that you interact with it. And then you have these sort of enhanced bond and cauterizing flames and such, just different things you can trigger off of by having your spirit about that allow you to just be cooler and better. You can pause the video in order to read through that stuff in more detail. The biggest one here, the 14th level one, it's kind of like a phoenix rising from the ashes, right? The bond with your wildfire spirit can save you from death. If the spirit is within 120 feet of you when you are reduced to zero and thereby fall unconscious, you can cause your spirit instead to drop to zero, and then you regain half your hit points and immediately rise to your feet. Once per long rest, but pretty damn good as long as you have your spirit out. So there it is, Circle of Spores, which is already in Ravnica. You can look through that. Circle of Stars, Circle of Wildfire, and then, of course, those optional class features. Let's see. The Fighter. Here we go. You get new fighting style options. If we look at fighters, just sort of as written, you choose... When you create a fighter, a creating a fighter, at first level you choose a fighting style. Archery, defense, dueling, great weapon fighting, protection, or two weapon fighting. Now, adding to that list, to all fighters, you now have blind fighting. I'll let you read through that yourself. Interception, superior technique, thrown weapon fighting, and unarmed fighting. You notice how a lot of these things, unarmed fighting, let's say, immediately screams to me. Very fight clubbish, right? These things lean into maybe some backstory. You're a pit fighter. You're a gladiator. Well, now the fighting style, the things you push on your, you know, the buttons on your character sheet, the things you write down in combat, now sort of attach and link to the story of how your fighter was raised or whatnot. So... You have a bunch of new fighting style options, martial versatility, which basically says as an ability score improvement, when you would get an, ability, an ASI, especially for fighters, which is a lot, 4, 12, 16, and more levels, you get to replace a fighting style with a different one if you didn't like the way it played out. And if you happen to be a battle master, you can swap out some maneuvers as well. That being said, let's look at the battle master maneuver option. So these are, notice we haven't even gotten into new subclasses yet. The fighters now have a bunch of new maneuver options if you're a battle master, right? So you can now ambush, bait and switch, brace, commanding presence, grappling strike, quick toss, and tactical assessment. A bunch of new tactical maneuver options for the battle masters. Now here we are with two new subclasses. I think there's two. Yep, you have the Psy Warrior and the Rune Knight. The Psy Warrior is really, really neat. I like it. I feel like as we're getting into this psionic stuff, this Tasha's is kind of like Watsi's little testing ground to see where Psy stuff might lean. Maybe there's some Dark Sun or something on the horizon here in 5th edition. So let's see what's what. Kind of like we were talking about just now with the Battle Master, right? You know how you get those superiority die? As a psionic warrior, <coughs> my coffee just killed me. 
you now have Sonic Warrior is a, a new subclass. Um, a Psy Warrior, I'm sorry. Psionic Power is your third level feature when you choose the subclass. You harbor a wellspring of psionic energy within yourself. You now represent that energy by using these psionic energy dice, which are D6s. And as you level up, the die types increase. D8 at 5th level, a D10 at 11th level. And as you would expect, similar to superior, superiority die, you use the psionic die. I'm stumbling. The 6-6 six, six sheep, 6-6 six, sheep, sick. You use these psionic dice to power and fuel your various features. The power is below use your psionic energy dice. You have a protective field. You have something called psionic strike. You can telekinetic movement, move an object or creature with your mind. With your mind. I like the way this handles this one. So protective field, you actually roll. You expend the psionic energy die, and as a reaction, you roll that die, and it reduces damage depending on what you rolled, right? So you spend the psionic energy die. Real quick, you get a number equal to your proficiency bonus, I think. You have a number of these dice equal to twice your proficiency bonus. So that's the pool of psionic energy dice you have. I like the way it handles some of these. Like protective field, you expend one of them and you roll it. And then the result is how much dam you reduce the damage by that much. And then psionic strike is you roll it and you deal additional force damage equal to the result. Telekinetic movement is just something you can do but it's only once per short or long rest, but you just get to use that ability, doesn't expend dice, which is neat. However, if you don't want to wait till you finish a short or long rest to reuse that ability, you can expend a psionic energy die. You don't have to roll it. You just kind of remove it from the pool to do this action again. So I like the way it handles stuff like that. And then, of course, your other abilities really lean into this stuff all the way up to, as a bonus action, to, granted, this is level 15, you can choose creatures which can include you that you can see within 30 feet up to a number of creatures equal to your int modifier. Each of the chosen creatures is protected by half cover for one minute. That is one thing you will notice as you scroll through here. A lot of these things are, you know, additional damage equal to the roll on your psionic die plus int modifier. Notice now how int modifier is a thing. So you're going to want to pay attention to your intelligence attribute if you're going to play as Psy Warrior. And then Telekinetic Master at level 18. Cast the Telekinesis spell once on each of your turns while you concentrate on the spell, including the turn when you cast it, you can make one attack with a weapon as a bonus action. So there's a lot of neat stuff they're playing in with the... I really like that feature of a lot of them, you'll spend the Psionic Energy die and roll it, and then it is enhanced further by your Intelligence modifier. So now you got to kind of lean into Intelligence a little bit. But some of the features, you just get to do them and then you don't do them again until you finish a rest unless you want to spend a die to kind of reactivate that ability. So pretty neat there. The Rune Knight. I feel like this guy was around somewhere else. Maybe I'm thinking the Echo Knight or something from Wild Mount, but I'm not sure if he was anywhere else. But playing into the Rune Knight, I'll kind of scroll through and let you pause it as you wish. They really are... Leans a lot into like giants and things like that to the point of you can actually grow in size. So you basically... Use magic runes to enhance your gear. You learn two runes of your choice. It kind of shows you how many runes you get as you level up. And then depending on what rune is on your items, you can get these various benefits. If you put cloud runes or fire runes or frost runes or stone runes on your items, they allow you to do certain things and to have access to certain abilities. Some of them are level specific, so you can't even put a hill rune on or a storm rune until your seventh level or higher. But they give you a lot of really neat things. Giant's Might as a bonus action. This is at third level, the moment you pick the Rune Knight. You magically gain the following benefits, all of them, which last for a minute. If you're smaller than large, you become large, along with anything you're wearing. You have advantage on strength and s checks and saving throws. On each of your turns, one of your attacks with a weapon or unarmed strike can deal additional damage. You're getting bigger, stronger, right? The Runic Shield, Great Stature, that's where you roll a 3d4 and you grow a number of inches in height. Moreover, the extra damage you deal with your Giant's Might now increases to a D8. All the way up to Runic Juggernaut, you learn how to amplify your rune-powered transformation. As a result, the extra damage you deal with the Giant's Might feature increases to a D10, and moreover, when you use that feature, your size can increase to huge, and while you're that size, your reach goes up by 5 feet. So, you know, mechanically, looking at what these, this can do, I feel like the Psy Warrior is 
a little cooler or, or not so much cooler. I just feel like there's, it's a little stronger perhaps. This though, I feel like has a lot of role play implications. Like, I mean, it, it really follows the theme of your growing in stature and, st- and, and size. So that's really neat. And then the remaining section for the fighter is all these battle master builds, which right here below are recommendations for how you might build a battle master to reflect various types of warriors. And it just walks you through. Choose this fighting style if you want to be an archer. Here's the maneuvers you should pick. Here's the feet you should pick. And then a little quick paragraph on kind of describing the way the archer might play. So the battle master, right? You know, you'll hear a lot of times for new players, hey, pick something martial class. If you're a new player and you're new to the game, don't pick a wizard. They can get very complicated at later levels. Pick something a little easier. But sometimes we want a little more complexity in moving parts than just a champion fighter. The battle master is cool, but to make full effect and be efficient in your tactical use, you have to really know how to use your superiority die and use all those maneuvers, especially now that we have new maneuver options. I like that it just kind of offers you a bunch of ways to kind of help guide you through that process of playing your battle master or at least helping you, okay, you have a character idea. Here's what that battle master might look like. Here's the actual things you want to pick for archer, bodyguard, brawler, duelist, gladiator, hoplite, lancer, outrider, pugilist, shock trooper, skirmisher, and strategist. There's a lot there. So these are all just guides versus, you know, new abilities and, and feats and whatnot. There's the fighter. How's we doing? We're doing okay. The monk. I said it would be long, but hopefully you're time stamping. All right. Optional class features. Dedicated weapon. Um, you train yourself to use a variety of weapons as monk weapons, not just simple melee weapons and short swords. So when you finish a shorter long rest, you can touch one weapon, focus your key on it, and you get what's there in the bullet points. All right. Key fueled attack. If you spend one key point or more as part of your action, you can make a melee attack with an unarmed strike or a monk weapon as a bonus action. You now have quick and healing. This is available to all monks again, folks, so not just a specific subclass. As an action, you can spend two key points and roll a martial arts die. You regain a number of hit points equal to the number plus your proficiency bonus. Focused aim. When you miss, you can spend anywhere from one to three key points, increasing your attack roll by two. So if you spend three key points, you increase it by six. That's probably enough to turn a miss into a hit. So at least it gives you the option there, right? If you feel like you need a a key point dump or something to do with it. And now you have some new monastic traditions. At third level, you can pick the Way of Mercy. We'll kind of scroll through here. These guys are kind of weird how I was reading through them. And here's what I mean by, I mean, the artwork is good, but I don't know. I'm not feeling the, whatever. The anatomy looks really off. That hand, yeah. Um, a lot of healing, hand of healing, hand of harm. The thing that kind of is reads weird to me here is there's a lot of like flurry of blows and stuff that you can heal with it, flurry of healing and harm, but it just kind of feels like punch the hell out of your allies and you heal them. It's just an awkward, I remember there was an old shoot me with the arrow to heal me. Just kind of wonky. Um, but I'll let you kind of, I'll scroll through slowly. You can pause as you will, but there it is. There's the new way of mercy. And then you have the way of the astral self. I like this one a lot. You get into, I mean, this image kind of captures it best. But again, the artwork is nothing to write home about. It looks kind of unfinished, more concepty. Disappointing for Watsi's production level, production value, and the resources of artists and art they have. Um, which is all basically to say there is significantly better art in many of their other books. Arms of the Astral Self. You take on astral form, and as a result, it allows you to kind of move and maneuver through your key points using various things and extra appendages and and certain attacks and whatnot. So I'll let you kind of scroll through and read that. But if you kind of want to have that, what this image seems to represent, very spiritual key, inner chi manifesting into this astral ghost-like appendage form, this might be a good fit for you. So there it is. That's for the monk. The Pally. Optional. New spell list stuff with some new spells, of course. You now have Blessed Warrior. You learn two cantrips of your choice from the Cleric spell list. That's for all paladins. Blind Fighting is... Oh, you just have some new fighting style options. I'm sorry. That's what this is. Second level paladin feature. When you choose a fighting style as your paladin, you now have three other options. Blessed Warrior, Blind Fighting, and Interception. All right? 
And then all paladins have access to harness divine power. You can expend a use of your channel divinity for your spells. As a bonus action, utter a prayer, and you regain one expended spell slot. I believe the cleric had a similar thing. Martial versatility. When you get an ASI, you can replace a fighting style with something else if you didn't like the one you picked. There's two new oaths. You have the Oath of Glory. This, I believe, is in Mythic Odysseys of Theros, so I won't go over it. But it's here as well. Now it's not specific to that world or that setting. This artwork is really well done. Kind of looks like the, the real gladiator, peerless athlete, right? Like the the Roman Greek champion type of thing, which is why it sounds like it fits from Mythic Odysseys of Theros. But it's here. And then you have the Oath of the Watchers. Um, I'll scroll down slowly and I'll let you pause that as you wish. But the essence of it is... The Oath of the Watchers binds paladins to protect mortal realms from the predations of extraplanar creatures, many of which can lay waste to mortal soldiers. So you're really big on, here's your spell list, channel divinity options. You're really big on like fighting against, like where is it at right here? You'll see a lot of, um, here's the best example. I'll go over the level 20 one. Yes, this is the capstone feature, so it's level 20, but still. You manifest a spark of divine power in defense of the mortal realms. As a bonus action, you gain all of the following for a minute. True Sight 120, advantage on attack rolls against Aberrations, Celestials, Elementals, Fey, and Fiends. When you hit a creature with an attack roll and deal damage to it, you can also force it to make a Charisma save. On a fail, the creature is magically banished to its native plane of existence. Yes, that's the level 20 feature called Mortal Bulwark, but that's the essence of what the Oath of the Watchers is. Obviously, at the lower levels, you're going to get that sort of theme, but at much lesser power level, of course. But that's kind of where they are. So, there it is. That's the Paladin, okay? Let's see. The Ranger. Tons of changes here. This one I'm just going to scroll through slowly and let you pause this the way you need to because there's just way too much here. They've changed it up completely. And I feel like, you know, the Ranger has always been the, the class that's had the most pushback, you know, and like it just is not well balanced, right? Like I've heard people say, why not just play a fighter? with all their different ASI improvements that they get, and be a, a crossbow or whatever, you know, crossbow expert fighter. Why do I even need the ranger? So whether these changes made the ranger viable, better, or whatever, it's up to you. But remember, I think if you take what's already in the player's handbook and then take the optional aspect of these, you might, you and your DM might be able to piece together something that will work for your ranger. But most importantly, instead of just homebrewing it and kind of shooting in the dark and hoping it works, this is assuming as official treatment, it already had some playtest aspects to it. You might be able to find something that you can settle on that feels relatively balanced, right? So here's the new first level ranger feature, which replaces natural explorer, deft explorer, right? Canny at first level, roving at sixth and tireless. Like I said, there's too much to go over with the ranger, so I'll let you, I mean, you can simply pause the video and just read it. Favored foe, this replaces the favored enemy feature and works with the Foe Slayer feature, all right? Here's your Ranger spells. Some new ones as well, Summon Beast, Summon Fae, Summon Elemental. This is available to all Rangers at second level. When you choose a fighting style, the following are also added to your list. You can now have Blind Fighting, Druidic Warrior, which sounds cool, and Thrown Weapon Fighting, okay? Spell Casting Focus, there it is. Primeval Awareness, this is a third level feature which replaces the Primeval Awareness feature that's in the player's handbook go through that. The versatility thing again, when you get an ASI, you can replace a fighting style if you didn't like what you had. Nature's Veil, which replaces the hide in plain sight feature. So these are all core ranger. We haven't gotten into the new archetypes. As far as archetypes, we have the Fey Wanderer. At third level, a ranger gains the ranger archetype feature. Um, what is this? A Fey Mystique surrounds you thanks to the boon of an Archfey, the shining fruit you ate from a talking tree, the magic spring you swam in, or some other auspicious event. So touched by Fey power and Fey energy, you get the following things. I'll let you kind of, as we did with everything else in the Ranger section so far, I'll let you kind of navigate through this. And now we have the Swarm Keeper. I kind of like the sound of this one. The artwork doesn't sell it as much, but you get the idea of that stuff. These swarms kind of can give you like extra attacks, I think, and they kind of form these clouds that can, you know, go into, which one was it? Like Mighty Swarm. Your gathering swarm grows mightier. Now your damage from it deals 1d8. 
if the creature fails a saving throw against being moved, the, the swarm can move you, kind of like pick you up and float you around. It can move enemies, things like this. Obviously, you're you're really playing a lot into that swarm of stuff that's surrounding you. And I think right here, yeah, there's a little chart if you want to roll on of what it is. Are they little pixies floating around you or are they swarming insects? So I like that it gives you at least some aesthetic kind of role play stuff, R-O-L-E play stuff that you can kind of uh, change your the theme and the essence of what your character represents when you've got this swarming cloud around you. And then you have the Beastmaster stuff in the player's handbook forms a mystical bond with an animal. As an alternative, a Beastmaster can take the feature below to form a bond with a special primal beast instead. And now you have three new ones. I'll let you kind of work through this. Here's the third level Beastmaster feature, which replaces the Ranger's Companion feature. Beast of the land, beast of the sea, beast of the sky. Okay? There's the ranger. A lot of new stuff there. Again, options. Don't have to use it if you don't want to. Rogues now have steady aim. As a bonus action, this is all third level rogues, you give yourself advantage on your next attack roll on the current turn. You can use this bonus action only if you haven't moved, and after you use the bonus action, your speed is zero. All right. So steady aim. The picture kind of indicates that you might want to do this with a ranged weapon. Yeah, like, I'm going to call it straight out, right? I know I keep kind of going over this, but I'm huge on art. I mean, I'm a wannabe artist. I have been for 30 years. I have friends that are professional art direct or art directors and such. With the resources as an official book, the art here sucks. That anatomy is way off. Looks terrible. I had mentioned something in a forum where someone was like, there's something weird about the art in this book. And I said, it felt like instead of Watsi relying on their resources of like top level artists and such, I'd assume even if you don't want to have a specific artist tied into this book, you have a database of just artwork that you're paying your magic artists and stuff to just create a bunch of art for D&D &D and then just have a file on your folder and you can pull that art anytime you want. I feel like what happened here is like, you know, someone's son or nephew was like, hey, I drew a picture. Can we put it in an official book? And they included it just for the sake of that. Um, I don't like that picture, but apologies. As a bonus action, you do that. Action, bonus action use, is, a, is that's a, a currency for rogues that you have to be careful with spending. So I don't like too much that you're giving another bonus action option because they already have a lot to do with it. But if you want to kind of get advantage, right, you're going to sneak attack from it, of course. And now, that's it. That's the only new rogue option for all baseline rogues. We have two new archetypes. We have the Phantom. Uh, I don't know if this is from another book. I'm not even going to look it up. But here it is. Echoes of the Dead, third level, have, who have died cling to you. Whenever you finish a short or long, you can choose one skill or tool proficiency that you lack and gain it. Okay, you lose this proficiency when you use this feature to choose a different one that you lack. All right. I was going to say, that's it? They could just keep getting them? Whales from the Grave. All right, playing into the f the dead stuff. Power of the Death to harm someone. Immediately after you do your sneak attack damage to a creature, you can target a second creature within 30 feet. Roll half the number of sneak attack damage. Okay, and it takes necrotic damage equal to the roll. Tokens of the Departed. You can Ghost Walk. Bonus action. I don't know, man, because they already have so many things to do with their bonus actions. You really got to make decisions here. You assume a spectral form. You have a flying speed of 10 feet, can hover, and attack rolls have disadvantage against you. All right. I don't mind the little, the defensive element of it here instead of the assassin, like, annihilate all things quickly. You can also move through creatures and objects. All right. And then Death's Friend, when you use the whales from the grave, which is the sneak attack thing that you can do to someone else. You can deal necrotic damage to both the first and the second creature. Okay. And then at the end of a long rest, a soul trinket appears in your hand. What the hell does that do? Ah. Right here. It talks about it in Tokens of the Departed. While a soul trinket, you can use a soul trinket in the following ways. So there it is. It plays into that. And then you have the soul knife. Psionic stuff. Psionic power. Psionic Energy Dice, very similar to what we saw with the Psy Warrior for fighters, right? That is a gigantic head. There we go. I'll let you kind of 
navigate through. They sound good. Psychic Veil and Ren... That's one thing Psionic stuff has always just sounded so damn epic. But there it is. That's the Rogue. I love Rogue. It's one of my... It's probably my top three classes in 5th edition d and I don't play much at all, but I really enjoy Rogue. I'm... That was one of the weaker, I think, of all the subclass or the classes I've gone through so far. Sorcerer. Uh, there's a lot. Like, a bunch of spells. I don't remember if... I'm going to click on this real quick. Okay, I think the asterisk means it's Xanathar's. Something like that. Yeah, so there's not like a spell level that's so significantly different. Just sort of, here's the one you can use now, I guess. So there it is. And then metamagic options. When you choose metamagic options, you have access to the following additional. You now have something called seekings. These are big because that's one of the defining characteristics of the sorcerer, right? You now have more options, which is always a good thing for that. Seeking spell and transmuted spell. I'll let you see what those are. Versatility. You can replace one of your metamagic, fe metamagic features or replace a cantrip. All, source le all fifth level sorcerers get magical guidance. When you make an ability check that fails, you can spend one sorcery point to re-roll the d20. And then Sorcerer's Origins, Aberrant Mind. I heard about this one. Psionic stuff, ooh. All right. Too much to cover here. Just think about that, aberrations. Psionics, Aberrant Mind, right? Very Intellect Devourer, Mind Flayer-ish or something like this. And now we have a Really cool piece of art. All the tieflings so far have been outstanding. Telepathic speech, psionic sorcery, psychic defensive, revelation, and flesh. I told you, the words, the, the labels and titles of psychic type of powers are always awesome. Warping implosion. Mm -hmm. As an action, you can teleport to an unoccupied space within 120. Immediately as you disappear... Each creature within 30 feet must make a strength save. On a fail, they take 3d10 force, and they're pulled straight towards the space you left. All right. Ooh, and the clockwork soul. Anything that sounds steampunkish, I'm sold. This is what I want to play right now. Automatic. What's the artwork? Oh, come on. Well, the tattoos look good. Oh, and those are little, like, modrons or something. Floating. So here you go. What's the essence? The cosmic force of order has suffused you with magic. That power arises from Mech Mechanus, or a realm like it, a plane of existence. The great Modrons, I love it. So here's your clockwork soul, spell list, manifestations of order, restore balance, bastion of law, trance of order, clockwork cavalcade. That's a sound, good sounding one. The spirits restore up to 100 hit points. Any damaged objects entirely in the cube are repaired instantly. All right. So there's the sorcerer. We're getting there, guys. Warlock. A lot of talk about these. I think Warlock has always been like one of the top three favorite classes from all players in D&D. &D, I think that's because they have seemingly the most potential to be broke-ass with dipping into Warlock or Coffee Lock or Sore Lock or whatever you want to call it. So we've got Pact Boon options. When you choose your Pact Boon feature, the following option is available to you. Pact of the Talisman. You have versatility. You can replace cantrips now. You can replace the option you chose for pack boon feature. And if you're 12th level or higher, replace one spell from your Mystic Arcanum feature with another Warlock spell. Eldritch, Eldritch Invocation options. When you choose Eldritch Invocations, you now have access to Bond of the Talisman, Eldritch Mind. I love it. Far Scribe, Gift of the Protectors, Investment of the Chainmaster. Let me slow down so you can pause it. Protection of the Talisman, Rebuke of the Talisman, and Undying Servitude. As far as patrons, you have the Fathomless. Here's the expanded spell list. You have plunged into a pact with the Deeps. Tentacle of the Deeps. Summon a Spectry Tentacle that strikes at your foes. Ten feet long, sixty feet of you. Last for a minute. One, uh, 1d8 cold, and its speed is reduced. As a bonus action, you can move the tentacle up to 30 feet and repeat the attack. Gift of the Sea. You swim now at 40 feet and can breathe underwater at level 1. All right. Oceanic Soul. Resistance to cold damage. Guardian Coil. Grasping Tentacles. What's the biggest one? 
As an action, you can teleport yourself and up to five creatures within 30 feet. Amid a whirl of, whirl of tentacles, you all vanish and then reappear up to a mile away in a body of water that you've seen. Wow, a mile away, that's good. And then the genie. This is the one that everyone has been talking about. I have seen this talked about more than any other class, subclass, anything in the book. I think more than anything in the book, except for maybe the the the, the origin stuff in the beginning where you can make whatever the hell race you want. The genie's vessel. Your patron gifts you a magical vessel that grants you a measure of the genie's power. I like that you have the flavor to it. Oil lamp, is it an urn? Is it an ornate lantern? While you are touching the vessel, you can use it in the following ways. Bottle respite. Genie's wrath. Elemental gift. I'm going to go right to the big one. Limited wish. You entreat your patron <clears throat> to grant you a small wish. As an action, you can speak your desire to your genie's vessel, requesting the effect of one spell that is sixth level or lower and has a casting time of one action. The spell can be from any class's spell list, and you don't need to meet the requirements in that spell, including costly components. The spell simply takes effect. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish 1d4 long rests. I kind of like that. I've never seen that used before. It inspired me to do something. Everything is always defaulted to long rest, and that's kind of the longest, or 24 hours, or next, more, next dawn. I like that it could be tomorrow. It could be almost a week. There it is. That's the warlock. The wizard. Additional wizard spells. Obviously the new ones from the book here. Cantrip formulas. You have scribed a set of arcane formulas in your spellbook that you can use to formulate a cantrip in your mind. Whenever you finish a long rest and consult those formulas, you can replace one wizard cantrip you know with another. Arcane Traditions, you now have Blade Singing. I swear this was in Forgotten Realms or somewhere else, but um, sounds very familiar to me. But there it is. Training in War and Song, Blade Song, Extra Attack, Song of Defense, and Song of Victory. I'll slow down so you can look through. All right, and then Order of Scribes. You magic cr magically create, that's neat, a tiny quill. In your freehand, the quill has the following properties. It doesn't require ink. When you write with it, it produces ink of a color of your choice. The time you spend a copy of spell into your spell book, basically it's better for you. And you can erase anything you write with the quill if you wave the feather over the text as a bonus action. All right. So that's more of a, like a role. It's not something in initiative that's going to matter, right, in combat. But you have an awakened spell book. That just sounds cool. Manifest mind. Obviously, there's going to be things here that are going to help you become a better wizard to kill stuff doesn't necessarily have to be nuking and evocation but just better ways of dealing with combative stuff but maybe you're not even playing evocation maybe you're playing more controlling wizard divination or abjuration or something so there it is i'll let you read through figure out what's up that is everything in chapter one that's the bulk of the book of course right i'm not even going to go over group patrons chapter two not a fan. Never have been. When I read about it in Eberron or heard, you know, I feel like it's, if your dungeon master puts enough effort and energy into your factions, into your groups, into your NPC organizations, someone said this best on a, on a message board or forum or something where they said, this is giving us more towards a very unnecessary system. I don't need these things as a, a catalyst to help me Yes, I'm very opinionated here, so let me talk to you about what's here, right? How patrons work. You're just getting more. If you like the group patron stuff that was in Eberron or sort of first introduced there, then you're going to get more here, right? You know, this is definitely seeds of inspiration for DMs, but um, I'm not going to waste my time with it. So you can, there's more on group patrons, okay? You can use that if you wish. Magical miscellany. This section contains new spells that the DM may add to a campaign, making them available to player, character, and monster spellcasters alike. The spell table lists the new spells, ordering them by level. So here we go. I want to show you just one. Let's back up and read through this here together. Think of the implications of this from a player and especially dungeon master point of view. Um, this is for Bard, Sorcerer, Wizard, and Warlock. Yes, it's a level 7 spell. So what is that, level 14? 
last tiers of gameplay type stuff. And it's a casting time of 10 minutes. You're not doing this in the middle of combat, right? But check this out. Conjuration spell, six hours. You and up to wait eight willing creatures within range fall unconscious for the spell's duration and experience visions of another world on the material plane, such as Orth, I think that's Greyhawk, Toral, uh, Forgotten Realms, Kryn, Dragonlance, I think, or Eberron. And notice it says, such as. So if you want it to be a different world, Sigil, or whatever, Planescape or something, go for it. If the spell reaches its full duration, the visions conclude with each of you encountering and pulling back a mysterious blue curtain. The spell then ends with you mentally and physically transported to the world that was in the visions. To cast the spell, you must have a magic item that originated on the world you wish to reach, and you must be aware of the world's existence, even if you don't know its name. And then it has little stipulations on if one of the eight happened to be hurt, damaged, or something like that during the six hours, and the, the full duration has not elapsed, they don't get teleported. If you take any damage while this spell is in effect, the spell's kind of canceled, and none of you are transported. But otherwise, my interpretation of this is, obviously you're not casting it in combat. If you do this in a safe area, and you all fall asleep for eight hours, or six hours, and the spell's duration finishes, you all pull back that curtain, and you get permanently teleported to that new place. So you're starting in the Mornland in Eberron. You happen to find a safe place for six hours in the Mornland. They cast this, and all of a sudden, next session, we're playing in Forgotten Realms. Uh, not much else to say about that. There's not a lot here, though. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, 21 spells in the whole book. So not a ton. There's new spells, though. And a lot of them feel, you know, summon, construct, summon elemental. You know, there's a lot of summons already, so... What's the difference? We're not going to go over every one. You know, does it weave in and out of different things? You are definitely getting Mind Whip and things that... Intellect Fortress, things that start signing Mind Sliver. Signing very psionic-y, psychic damage-y, things like that. So you can play into that for sure. Which does have a lot of impact because psychic damage is something that is difficult to resist. And, you know, it's one of the more devastating forms of damage. And it does lean into some of the more devastating things. Like aberrations and Mind Flayers and the horrible stuff that melts your brain. So there you have it. I'm not even counting these two because they were already there. I've heard of these spells for two years now. Um, so there's spells. It has some main some means of personalizing spells, but I don't know. Like I don't need charts and books to see this, the essence of it. If someone wants to cast Fireball and because of the flavor of their character, who's a purple dude, and they want to manifest it as this purple orb of energy... I'm not going to change the damage type to necrotic or something. It's still fire, but it's just purple flame. Flavor it how you want. If your Eldritch Blast has skulls <laughs> flying towards you, I think I'm thinking of like the video game Twisted Metal or something. I swore some character had that. Flavor it how you want. Here it's kind of trying to give you some rules as to how to personalize things, you know, and, and I... That gets too much into my opinions on this, which is definitely for another video, which I'll probably be creating. But um, that's it. That's your magic and miscellany section. Is you have those new spells and personalizing spells. There are some magic items. Um, tattoos. Let's click on a couple just to see how they kind of work. Produced by a special needle, this magic pet tattoo contains a single spell up to 5th level wrought on your skin by a magic needle. To use the tattoo, you must hold the needle against your skin and speak the command word. The needle turns into ink that becomes the tattoo, which appears on the skin in whatever design you like. Once the tattoo is there, you can cast its spell, require, re, requiring no material components. And there it is. It shows you know, the rarities, what it covers, how noticeable it is if you have a legendary, what it does. You know, blah, blah, blah. So that's a spell rot tattoo. You know, you can have a... How many is there? Now, there's a decent amount here, actually. But a lot of them are all tattoos, just different versions of tattoos. But there's a, a good amount here. Um, I like the thing of tattoos. You know, I mean, I've seen that for 35 years, you know, of ways of basically how can I get a spell onto my body permanently. But... Um, there's a lot here. I'm not going to go over any of them at all. Jeez, one, two, three, four, five, six, 
Six artifacts and one legendary. Baba Yaga's Mortar and Pestle. Mortar and pe- All right. When you have this, <laughs> there's some stuff worth, you know, this is an entire story arc. Obviously, it's an artifact. You know, it's not just something you found in the dirt. Um, so, I'm kind of excited about that. Maybe I'll do a separate video specifically on these cool items or whatnot. But there's a lot of magic items here, a lot more than the spells. So that's a good thing. Um, let's see, DM tools. I haven't heard a lot of good news about this section at all, which is disheartening to me because I'm a dungeon master at heart and at, at its core. Session zero. There's nothing here w worthwhile for me at all. Um, maybe for you, you know, it's just kind of talking about what session zero is. Definitely gearing it towards new players. Hey, here's some things you really want to do when you get to the table with your players. Where it starts talking about social contracts, you know, things to be careful of. Don't discuss the, you know, it's very, to me, this feels like Watsy's and, and official D&D's approach to let's make sure we're as PC as possible. You know, let's make, you know, guys, I'm going to give you my whole summary on the Dungeon Master's tool section for the most part that of what's here. Be a cool human being. Don't be a dick. Be good people. Play with people whose company you enjoy. Play with, if you can, you know, don't try and just, I know you want to get a game together and you just want to play, play with anyone. And, and this is going to happen when you're playing at conventions. But try and sit at the table with people you'd play board, board games with. People who you don't mind coming to your home, hanging around your kids. Play with good people. Don't be an asshole. Work, it's a cooperative game. Play with good people. Have good discussions. Figure out you know, how far you can push things. What are some, what's some subject matter that you don't want? Just communicate as human beings. It has nothing to do with D&D. &D. Just when you're sitting at a coffee shop, there's things you want to talk about and things you don't, you know, there's things that are appropriate in a game setting and things that need to be discussed. Big real world problems, social contracts and things that don't need to be discussed at your game. You know, play D&D &D to kind of escape from that a little bit and just enjoy and have fun. We don't need to talk about religion and abortion and politics at the D&D &D game. I don't need things in my D&D &D story to highlight the problems in the world. You know what I mean? Like, just play the game and just have fun with it. Stop being so damn complex with this stuff. And I feel like this is just an entire section. And I know I'm going on my little soapbox tirade here, but I've been around this for a long time. I've played every edition since the game was basically invented. I started in 7980. This is a bunch of stuff that can easily be summarized with Dungeon Master's Tool section. Be a good human being. Don't be an asshole. Play with people who's, you know, who you have fun with. Other than that, sidekicks, more NPC creation stuff, parlaying with monsters. If you're a DM and you want to have monsters be able to talk to you, you know, I don't need charts to tell me whether you can talk with if I want to Hulk smash you with a Cyclops, I'm just going to do that. But if I'm Borborygmos from Ravnica and you've got something to offer me, we can talk. So environmental hazards, supernatural regions. I mean, I don't need rules and bullet points to tell me how to adjudicate this stuff. If I tell you, and I don't care what the rules say, that you're going into a haunted place, roll a wisdom save. Okay, you failed. You don't want to go in. That's it. We don't need to have a discussion on it. I don't need to refer to any charts. I don't care what you do. That's just what it is. So, um, not a fan of that section. And unfortunately, that's kind of how we end it. Puzzles. There are so many pieces of content in the DMs Guild that are significantly better. Grimtooth's traps and things like this. So, um, you know, look through that as you want. There's some puzzles there, but I mean, you can just read a good book of Da Vinci Code and you'll find enough stuff that's kind of here you know there's nothing new and under the sun here i mean there's some potential seeds here that you can read through but um anyway that's what there is this has been more than long enough i'm going to end it there that's the kind of going back to the table of contents that's the spotlight the deep dive into what is in tasha's cauldron of everything some more tasha's videos coming soon with me rambling more about my thoughts and opinions on all of this stuff Thanks everyone for watching. I'll see you guys later. Take care.